y'all know there's this mechanic in Pokemon games where each Pokemon has a super rare chance of spawning with a different color palette? It's called Shinies, and it's a pretty neat concept. And that got me thinking, what if Deltarune had Shinies? It's a pretty simple mechanic to introduce, just add a low percentage chance to swap out a color palette, and it would add some fun replayability to the game. They've already got a lot of Pokemon style mechanics, what with us collecting darkness for our castle town. Heck, they even have stat screens and elemental types, just like Pokemon. I love doing sprite art, and this sounded like a fun project, so I decided to take it upon myself to make my very own shinies for Deltarune Chapter 1. This video chronicles my artistic journey, the inspiration behind my shinies, and how I settled on the ones I chose. If y'all enjoyed this video and would like to support the channel, consider donating on Ko-fi or Patreon. And if you'd like to see more homemade shinies, make sure to like and subscribe. If we can get this video up to 50,000 views, I'd be more than happy to make shinies for Chapter 2 as well. But that's enough preamble. Let's dive into these shinies. I like to start from the beginning, and the first regular enemy you encounter is the Rudin. As the first enemy, Rudin bears the responsibility of introducing the shiny mechanic and looking good in my thumbnail. As such, Rudin's shiny design needed to be eye-catching and distinct. I also wanted my shinies to be fun references to the lore and personalities of the characters, and Rudin's main personality trait is that they love money. As such, what would better suit the wealth-obsessed Rudin than a golden shiny? Now, technically, Rudin specifically loves of jewels, but some jewels are yellow and orange, so it still works. There's also a third reason for why I chose this specific color palette, but in order to understand that, we need to talk about Rudin Ranger. Rudin Ranger was interesting, as they have two core concepts that stood out to me. For one, they are a reference to the Power Rangers, with them even having a cheeky check line about them all wanting to be the Red Ranger. Aside from that, their second most prominent trait is how they are obsessed with one-upping the regular the Rudins. Almost everything they do is focused on proving they are superior, to the point that it kind of makes you wonder why they're so obsessed with Rudin. As for their shiny, at first I tried to go the route of referencing Super Sentai, which is the Japanese show that Power Rangers is based on. If the Rudin Ranger was normally a reference to the leader of the Power Rangers, then why not have their shiny be a reference to the leader of the first Super Sentai team? Now, this was a fine idea, and the shiny I made from it looked okay, but it ended up looking just too similar to their original color palette to feel special. I then tried to focus more on Rudin Ranger's character as my source of inspiration, which led me to an idea that I liked a lot more. Introducing Green Rudin Ranger. This shiny is a twofold reference. Firstly, it's a reference to the Green Ranger. For those who don't know, while the Red Ranger was the leader in the beginning, they later introduced the Green Ranger as a mysterious lone wolf with a cool sword that was also a flute for some reason. This guy would eventually become the White Ranger and take over as leader of the Power Rangers. As such, since he was the next leader and was objectively cooler than the Red Ranger, it only made sense that this would be the color palette that Rudin Ranger would go for. The sword even ended up looking similar to the Green Ranger flute sword. Now, the Power Rangers reference was fun, but the element that made it extra special to me was how it resembles the regular Rudin, which I thought was perfect irony. It's like the Ranger is implying that Rudin downgraded by becoming golden, while also reinforcing just how obsessed the Rudin Ranger is with regular Rudin. This further leans into my headcanon that the Rudin Ranger secretly admires Rudin, but expresses it in an unhealthy way, similar to how Susie initially behaves around Chris. It's very Sundere, you could say. Furthermore, this Power Ranger motif is also the third motivation behind my choice for the regular Rudin turning orange. It's because the Orange Ranger is the least common type of Power Ranger, and is also a joke character in the comics. Needless to say, the idea of the regular Rudin going from the coolest looking Power Ranger to the lamest is just icing on the cake for this huge Power Rangers metaphor. Now, you could say that I'm overthinking these design choices, and that's fair, but personally, I'd rather have shinies with too much thought put into them rather than no thought at all. Speaking of which, it's at this point that I'd like to clarify a few rules I set for myself while making these shinies. For one, shinies are about getting a cool version of something familiar, so while I am allowed to alter their color palette, I am not allowed to change their design. 
In other words, while I can turn Rudin orange, I cannot change Rudin's shape or size. Don't get me wrong, I love designing brand new sprite art, but it is far more time consuming and it also kind of oversteps the concept of shinies. The second limitation I set for myself was that I limited the number of colors I could use to be more or less the same number as used in the original sprite. For example, Rudin is composed of precisely four colors. As such, I did my best to come up with a shiny that also used four colors. Adding more colors can be fun, and it can add a lot more depth and detail, but it would also make them look less and less like Toby Fox's art style, and I wanted this to feel like something that could actually appear in the game. That said, there were some sprites that I added or subtracted a color or two, but I only did it as a last resort, and I did my best to stay as close to the original color count as possible. Back to the shinies, next in line is Hathi and Head Hathi, who had the easiest shinies to make on this list. They only have three colors in their base palettes, and given how they are heart-shaped darkeners in a sequel to Undertale, there was really only one route I could take. Introducing Red Hathi and Gray Head Hathi. In case it wasn't obvious, this is a reference to the two different types of souls in Undertale, with humans like Frisk and Kara having red souls, while monsters like Toriel and Asgore had white souls. Character-wise, this makes a fair bit of sense, as Hathi is all about love and kindness, but is also an enemy who attacks you, which makes the dual nature of the red soul a perfect metaphor for them. Similarly, Head Hathi is all about being a colder, more lonely variant of Hathi, so them having a gray, emotionless color palette is quite appropriate. Now, you could argue that they should be swapped, as monsters are generally more loving than humans, but since Hathis are the second type of regular enemy you encounter, I wanted them to have the more eye-catching design. Next up is Jigsari, who is half puzzle piece and half mouse. Funny enough, I didn't realize they were a mouse for a while, as they mostly just look like a puzzle piece in their base design. With that in mind, I decided to focus on the mouse side of their identity when designing their shiny. Introducing Mouse Jigsari. For this color palette, I took inspiration from this scarf mouse character from Undertale, and I was quite pleased with how it turned out. It's admittedly not as fancy as my first two shinies, but I think that works for Jigsari, and it manages to distinguish itself from their base design while still maintaining a pleasing aesthetic. Next up is Pawn Man, and given how they are a white chess piece, it was only logical to turn them into a black chess piece for their shiny. And here's a little known fun fact. Black Pawn Men already exist in Deltarune. You probably don't remember them as Pawn Men, but you actually do have to dodge attacks from them in the overworld. And since Toby Fox thoughtfully provided a color palette for these Black Pawn Men, I was more than happy to use those colors for my shiny. Introducing Black Pawn Man. This is easily the coolest looking shiny in this video, as the black and blue contrasting with the red eye just goes so hard. After Pond Man comes Rabbik, and given their simple design, it was a bit tricky to find a suitable color palette for them. Since they are part rabbit, I initially tried to reference this rabbit lady when designing their shiny. Unfortunately, her fur is this greenish color that just looks kind of grody when put on Rabbik. Thankfully, after a quick perusal of of their dialogue, I noticed that Rabbik has four separate lines calling them either a boy or a girl. And since their base design already features the boy-affiliated color of blue, why not have their shiny feature the girl-affiliated color of pink? And voila, Pink Rabbik. I even managed to salvage the reference by taking this shade of pink from this rabbit guy. I also made a slightly pink shiny version of the small rabbit, although it's admittedly barely noticeable. Next up was the hardest regular enemy I had to make a shiny for, Bloxer. I went through quite a few variants for Bloxer before settling on one I actually liked. First I tried to reference the Elder Puzzler from Undertale, as they love block puzzles and Bloxer is, of course, made of blocks. A fine idea, but the end result was not great. It doesn't look bad, but I'm of the opinion that shiny should feel like upgrades, so having the colors all feel so drab just doesn't appeal to me. My next source of inspiration came from Smash Brothers in the form of Little Mac. Toby had already referenced Smash Brothers a lot in Deltarune, so why not have his Boxer Darkner reference the Boxer from that game? Again, a fine idea, but the end result just 
didn't pan out. It's still not bad, but something about Bloxer having this fleshy skin color just didn't sit right with me. I then tried to reference the LEGO logo by integrating yellow into Bloxer's design, but this ended up looking too similar to their base design to really satisfy me. With so many failed attempts, I went back to the drawing board and sifted through Bloxer's dialogue to find some sort of inspiration. They attack you with Tetris blocks, so I briefly considered using those, but Tetris integrates all sorts of colors, so the reference wouldn't really land. I then considered referencing this unused robot character from Undertale, but again, the colors were too drab. But then, finally, I found the answer I was seeking. Bloxer's main mechanic in battle is that their body is all out of sorts, and it's only when they're happy with the shape of their body that they'll let you spare them. Similarly, in the castle town, there's this other Bloxer who is insecure about their choice to integrate multiple leg pieces, and they ask the party to keep it a secret. Body dysmorphia is no laughing matter, and after seeing what a pivotal role it plays in Bloxer's character, I knew exactly what colors to go with. Introducing Blue Bloxer. This design works for a variety of reasons, as not only does it reference their character by integrating the colors of the trans flag, but it also acts as an inverted version of regular Bloxer. Instead of red skin with a blue shirt, they now have blue skin with a red shirt. I am really quite pleased with how this turned out, so I hope you guys like it too. Now, technically, I could end the video here, as I have now covered all of the recruitable enemies encountered in Chapter 1. Giving shinies to the bosses wouldn't really make sense since you don't recruit them or fight them multiple times. However, the hyperfixation within me was too strong, and the idea of tackling Chapter 1's bosses was just too enticing. So I decided to go the extra mile and cover these guys as well. If you like, you could think of this as a reference to shiny locking, which is a phenomenon in Pokemon games where certain shinies are inaccessible in normal gameplay, and can only be found in the code. To begin this batch, I decided to tackle three characters at once. I am of course talking about Lancer, the King, and Susie. I knew I had to develop these three simultaneously, as their stories and themes are so intimately tied together. In case you don't know what I'm talking about, the three of them effectively represent the same person, just at different points in their arc. Lancer is naive and innocent, and has yet to be warped by the cruel world. Susie has been burned, which has made her jaded and violent, but she's not so far gone that she couldn't turn things around. And King has become so absorbed in his hatred and cynicism that he won't let anyone in and is miserable. In effect, Lancer is what Susie once was, while King is what Susie could become if she isn't careful. Given this interwoven narrative, I knew I had to make their shinies reference each other. So, to begin, I took Lancer and worked to give him Susie's color palette in an aesthetically pleasing way. I knew the majority of his palette would need to be shades of purple, but I also knew that the vibrant aqua of her axe and the bright gold of her spikes needed to be integrated as well. The end result is this. I had his bike draw from Susie's axe, its flame being this cool aqua, while the body drew from her clothes. And since Lancer doesn't wear accessories, I had his emblem and teeth represent her gold spikes. Actually, that's not quite right. I initially didn't give him the gold teeth, but after I designed King, I knew I had to do it. You see, given that King is literally just a larger version of Lancer, I knew his shiny would need to feel like it was in the same theme. In other words, King would have Susie's colors as well. And the end result was this gruesome monster. Now, I know this aesthetic won't be everyone's cup of tea, as it might just be too gross, but I personally think this works really well for King. It really highlights his nightmarish body, what with his bizarre stomach mouth contrasting his kingly crown. Notably, I did not integrate the bright aqua from Susie's axe, and that's mostly because I couldn't find a good place to put it, but you could also give it a lower spin as well. Having the king lose something that both Lancer and Susie had could symbolize how he lost the hope and optimism that allows them to see the bright side of life. I won't pretend this king design is perfect, I'm sure some of you clever folks could come up with even better designs, but I'd say I'm pretty satisfied with how this turned out. But now, it's time for the big dog. 
Given her extreme importance in the plot, getting Susie's shiny right was crucial. I knew I wanted her shiny to reference Lancer and King, but the difficulty was raised by Susie having more colors to work with than either of the other two. I needed this new Susie sprite to have both a vibrant axe blade and vibrant spikes, as those are key attributes of her aesthetic. But given how few colors Lancer and King have, how could I possibly accomplish this goal? Well, the end result I settled on was this. The axe integrating the gold from Lancer's bike was a natural alteration, but it took me a minute to realize that swapping the aqua from her axe to her spikes does a really good job of complementing her new blue color palette. And while it is a bit subtle, you could read her having this blue hair as being a nod to Godzilla's spikes, which is relevant because Susie compares herself to Godzilla in Chapter 2. I'm quite pleased with how this Susie turned out, and while I could see better versions of Lancer and King being made, I doubt there are many versions of Susie that I would like more than this. I'm quite proud of it. But wait, we've still got a few more bosses to cover. Next up is a bit of a silly one, but I decided to try and give the Ralsei dummy a shiny. Fun fact, the dummy actually wears a slightly different shade of green than Ralsei, so initially I tried swapping the dummy to match. It's obviously not very good, as it's almost identical to the original, but I briefly considered keeping it anyway as a nod to stuff like Shiny Articuno, where the shiny is barely different. However, unlike the Pokemon Company, I actually want my fans to be happy when they get a shiny, so I kept working. The next variant has the colors flipped, with the hypothetical lore being that maybe Ralsei once considered wearing a pink robe with a green scarf before settling on his current outfit. He then dumped his prototype onto the dummy. A cute idea, but the end result really doesn't work for me. I think when pairing vibrant colors with dull colors, it's better for the vibrant colors to be an accent rather than the majority but that's just me. It was at this point that I went back to Undertale for inspiration, and who better to reference than the original Mad Dummy themselves? Not only does she get multiple forms to pull from, but she's also just the best ghost character, in my opinion. I mean, Naps the Baluk and Metaton are fine, but I am a Mad Dummy stan all the way. As such, I ultimately developed two shinies based on Mad Dummy and Mad Mew Mew, and here they are. Both designs have their strengths, and I do like them both, but if I had to choose one above the other, I think I'd go with the left one. This is partially because when I asked a friend what they thought of the Mad Mew Mew shiny, they said, and I quote, it looks like salami with mustard on it. Lamau. In addition, this dummy is a dummy, after all, so referencing the Mad Dummy makes more sense than referencing Mad Mew Mew. Plus, look at them! They're practically twins! Next up is the sprite that arguably gave me the most trouble, Clover. Having a sprite that is predominantly white made it pretty hard to find a shiny that didn't look terrible. I tried changing their eyes from blue to red, but that just didn't change enough to satisfy me. And when I tried turning them into a black clover, she just looked too much like some sort of edgy Sonic.exe creepypasta. So, as per usual, I went looking for something I could reference as a source of inspiration, and I found this Pokemon sprite. I figured, hey, it's got three heads, clover Clover has three heads, why not? However, when I tried to convert Clover to these colors, this was the result. Now, personally, I quite liked this design, and I had intended to use it as the shiny in this video, but after consulting friends to see what they thought, they were unimpressed. I thought that the brown color made her look like a fun, chocolatey alternative to Clover's usual vanilla, but apparently she looks more like crap than chocolate. So with a heavy heart, I went back to the drawing board, and this time I decided to reference something a bit more interesting. Moonside. Moonside, for those who don't know, is a dark world in Earthbound that is very similar to the dark worlds from Deltarune. It also has this very distinct neon aesthetic that I find quite appealing. So, with that aesthetic in mind, I revamped Clover's Shiny into something I am quite pleased with. Presenting Moonside Clover. 
This design was really fun to make, as not only is it an Earthbound reference, not only does it look nice, but it also allowed me to invert her colors without looking like a creepypasta. And if you're wondering why I chose yellow, that's because the inverted version of her usual blue accents is yellow. The more you know. Next up was everyone's favorite checker piece, C-Round. Much like with Pond Man, the only logical choice for C-Round shiny was to turn them from red to black. It's not the craziest shiny, but it does make the most sense. K-Round follows a similar philosophy. Note that I kept the crown gold because the mechanic of kinging a checker piece is identical for both black and red pieces. Also, the crown used later in the game is an addition used by Rules Card, so it's not part of K-Round's usual design regardless. And with that, we're ready for the final shiny of this video. Jevil. Now, initially, I tried my darndest to make a shiny based off of Sham, as Sham was Jevil's only friend. However, sadly, the result just didn't satisfy me. It's not bad by any means, I like the orange tongue, and it actually works decently well as a Halloween-themed outfit. However, not bad is not good enough for the most iconic character in Chapter 1. Jevil needed something a lot more eye-catching, and if referencing his best friend wasn't going to work, there was only one option left. Not only is Spampton also a secret boss, but he also has a history with Jevil. Plus, having Jevil's shiny reference Spampton acts as cool foreshadowing for those who find it in Chapter 1. In fact, I love the idea of all the secret bosses referencing each other in their shinies. They could even have the final secret boss reference Jevil, thus having it come full circle. That would also hint at the idea of the game being stuck in a time loop, which is always cool. But that's enough rambling. I am now proud to present the final shiny of the video, Shiny Jevil. I'm gonna be frank with you guys, this shiny slaps. Not only is it a solid reference, but Jevil having white skin is a really cute nod to real life clowns. Also, I love the red tongue. The fact that the tongue is only sometimes visible is really fun, because Spampton's red cheeks are also only sometimes visible. I love this shiny, and I can't imagine a better alternative. But hey, that's just my opinion. What do you guys think? Can you come up with a better shiny for Jevil? Do you like the ideas of shinies in Deltarune? And would you like to see me make shinies for the enemies from Chapter 2? Let me know in the comments below. Before we head out, I'd like to give a huge shout out to my patrons for their continued support. A special thanks goes to Erol, Suit Number 1, Leo Dragon Tamer, Limping Penguin, and Tibby Fitzhugh. An extra special thanks goes to Super CKX7 for supporting me on the Ralse tier. And a huge thanks goes to Spindrift for being the only big shot willing and able to support me on the Spampton tier. Y'all's support really means the world to me, and even though I haven't been uploading as much as I would prefer, I still want to make content that you all will enjoy. Thank you for sticking it out with me, and I hope you all have a happy Halloween. And with all that said, I think I'm about ready to sign out. Like if you enjoyed the video, comment if you've got something to say, subscribe if you want to see more, and as always, have a fantastic day.